Hi, this is Tim Hamilton, the co-host of the Maryland Crabs, and I'm here with a crab cake for your listening pleasure. What's a crab cake? Well, it's not quite a full episode. It's just a little snippet. Stay tuned and check it out. Make sure you check us out on themarylandcrabs.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast or find us on Facebook at the Maryland Crabs Podcast. Don't forget, subscribe, rate us, iTunes. Go there now. And welcome to the Maryland Crabs Crab Cake. I'm here with Mark Crooks, Associate Judge Mark Crooks. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, I'm glad we were able to find our way back into the, uh, the building. That was our first big challenge. You know, I was scrambling to get to you from Dunkin' Donuts, which is my normal haunt in the afternoon to visit. And I realized that we didn't have a plan B. It was just sort of old school. We'll meet at the top of the Empire State Building at 8 p.m., you know, on the third after or whatever, the third Columbus Day after the New Year. <laughs> <laughs> and a rom-com reference going right into the right. crab cake, your first one. Exactly. So it's great to be in front of a judge without panicking a little bit. I'm going to be honest. My grandfather was a judge. Is that right? Where? Yeah. He was, let's see, National Labor Relations judge, something okay. like that. So he was a federal judge. Uh, yeah, those federal judges, you know, they get a lifetime gig, so they have it a little bit different than... Yeah, than it was cushy now. for him. He had, he told me, I was a kid though, he told me stories about, about uh, what's his name? Uh, guy who disappeared. Buried in the end zone. Oh, Hoffa. Yeah, Jimmy Hoffa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was telling me Jimmy Hoffa's story, stories when I was 10. I so just, was Jimmy in front of him? I, yeah, he, was, he, was, he said wow. it was Jimmy and a bunch of guys sitting in the front row with their arms folded, like just staring <laughs> at a witness. And he goes, and the witness is like, I can't remember anything. And that was that. That's funny because, you know, the, the judges, after 9-11, I went up to New York and practiced there as a state prosecutor. A lot of the judges had legacies. One of the judges uh, was a judge who had worked closely with Serpico. His favorite thing was to digress and start telling you sort of references to Serpico. And you never knew if that was a good thing or a bad thing if he was going on the Serpico sort of lane. Well, it was but. fun for the first you know, the first <laughs> couple times. And then after like, you know, the 20th time, you're like, ah, oh, the right. Serpico That's story. Right. You have to Let it chuckle. go. <laughs> Live in the present. Yeah. So here's what freaks me out a little bit is because you were around my age and you have like a real job. So you're not just like a podcaster. And you know, so you actually have authority. Well, it's sort of like I, I, when the Playboy playmates were all of a sudden younger than you were. You know, it's funny. I, I who Someone was talking about how you go to the Oval Office and you're not cowed. How do you just not quake? And this is what's go pre-Trump, let's just say, <laughs> any previous uh, president. And I can't recall who it was, but they commented, they said that one of the chief sort of Rubicons is when you realize that the president is younger than you. Suddenly, you still feel the gravity and the weight of the Oval Office and the person, but suddenly sort of the, the quake factor just wanes a little bit. And so... I always say when I was in the military, and this comes from Herman Wook's book, uh, but I always said it was... Is it, is it Wook? I always say Wook, but it's one of those words that I've never heard someone I just say out loud. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but he always said, er, in um, Kane Mutiny, he said, the military is designed by someone brilliant to be run by idiots. And in some ways, you know, courts are like that. In other words, I'm not saying judges are idiots. I'm just saying that the trappings of the robe and the elevated bench, all of that has a, I guess, a purpose. It's grown up organically over time and designed to make you feel like there's a little more going on upstairs than perhaps there is. <laughs> uh, but it's intimidating. You watch, you know, I watch Law and Order, and that's where I get all my information. As I told that to Wes Adams. He's a friend of the podcast. And when I talked to him, I said, all my information about the courtroom comes from that. Mm, Okay, Mr. McCoy. You know, just (laughs) uh, all that sort of thing. Right. And they're just very intimidating. Well, it's funny. You know, it's funny you bring that up because uh, I was a um, state prosecutor in New York. And a lot of people would often ask, how is it different from law and order? And I would always say there's two differences. One, McCoy always seemed to have the luxury of focusing on one case. Yeah, I always thought, yeah. But more than that, the courtrooms didn't have beautiful um, murals of the Dutch landing (laughs) in Manhattan. It was quite the opposite. In fact, the first trial I had, I was so nervous and I, you know, I just, I was almost looking for a lifeline just so my voice wouldn't sound like I was in the throes of puberty. And I looked up behind the judge and the D had fallen down and the R and the S so instead of saying, in God we trust, it said, in go we tut. <laughs> Almost sound a hieroglyphic, you know. Um, and you Egyptian just burst into hysterical no, giggles. Exactly, right. exactly. No, but it, it was a good decompression, and it suddenly made me realize if what I was doing was that important, I wouldn't be in a courtroom where it said, in go we tut, you know. <laughs> I remember, I, I don't know why I think about this. Whenever I, I meet someone who's, like, I thought about this when I saw Wes Adams, too. But I remember in 1988, I was a senior in high school. And we went to Rockville to see a court proceeding. It was just like an afternoon trip for some poli sci club or something like that. And they were having the sentencing. I just remember it was the class and it was like, you know, 10 of us and the defendant, his attorney, the prosecutor and the judge. And so it was like, it was empty. And the class all left. But since I lived nearby, I stayed just to see what happened. And the guy was like 19. He was a year older than we were. And they sentenced him to life without parole. Mm. Like, and I, I just think about that. That was my afternoon. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we sit here now, that was, you know, 30 years ago. 
that guy's still in prison, yeah. life without parole. And I just think just the gravity of what happens there. I mean, at one point you can see in God we trust being mangled by falling down letters, but the impact that has on people's life, it's just, it's terrifying when you think about it. Yeah, it is. I think sentencing, contrary to popular misperception, that sentencing is one of the, I do think one of the most challenging things a judge does. And I, I don't know, I, I know there's stereotypes abounding about hang them high judges, but I really have never met a judge that particularly enjoys it. And I think there'd be You'd have to question him or her if that was something you really look forward to. Do you have one that sticks with you? Um, you know, I have, I have some ones that are really, really uh, a set of arbitrary results born of statutes. And you know, you always say bad facts make bad law. And there was, yeah, a, I always do say that. <laughs> that's right. You say it all the yeah, time. Yeah, right? <laughs> But anyway, there was a. This is a paradigm that I'm glad um, I can tell you that there's an addendum to the story. But there was a guy who uh, reached into the. Um, back of a commercial truck and stole a package. I'm going to tell you later at the end of the story what that was in the package. But that was it's like a cast away. You know, we're never going to know what's there. No, you'll know. You'll know. It'll, it'll actually make you depressed. But anyway, he reached <laughs> That's in. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> you don't know me. Yeah, 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 good, good. I'll bring you down. No, but that's deemed a burglary only because a commercial truck in New York was defined as a, a building counterintuitive. I know. Because someone slept there? Oh, that's... Probably. That's probably the etymology or the origin of that. But when the guy was fleeing from the package, an undercover plainclothes police officer came up to him and he pushed her. And she fell down and she scraped oh. her knee. And that made it technically because someone was injured in the flight from a burglary. So you're sort of at the outer limit already because it's a truck, not a building, but it's deemed a building. And he pushes her and she scrapes her knee, but there's no injury other than that scrape. I'm not trying to minimize, not saying you should no, go no, around I... pushing off duty cops, but it made it, quote unquote, a violent crime. In New York, they had a three strikes law where if you had three violent crimes, you got 15 to 25 to life. So the other two crimes fell outside. And they, oh, I forgot to mention, they had to be within 10 years. So twice previously, he had had a gun and possession of a firearm in New York is also deemed a violent crime, even if it's not brandished. And so he now had three violent convictions. The other two fell outside of 10 years, but the amount of time that you spend incarcerated tolls. So now technically... He's done three violent crimes within 10 years, even though this, there's no evidence that this guy's ever physically even punched anyone. Not to right. say he hasn't, but I'm just saying in the criminal world, uh, at least what's memorialized in charges and statutes. Anyway, he gets convicted, and really his, his record was um, shielded from the court and other parties for various reasons. And when the judge finally so pronounced— He doesn't see it. The judge doesn't see it. Uh, only at the sentence. I got gotcha. you. And when the judge was made aware of it, he felt bound by the statute. And so he sentenced this guy for 15 to 25 to life— and it turns out what he had stolen was a ceramic cow from Scotland. Oh, man, this is the best thing. So anyway, that sticks with me only because it makes you realize that even if statutes are well attended, you have to, as, well, certainly as a prosecutor, what I then was, you have to use discretion and certainly what charges you bring because they have consequences. And that's a lot of power that you should take. You, know, you should feel the weight and the gravity of what your responsibilities are in that way. But certainly as a judge, you need to um, study the landscape to make sure that unintended consequences don't happen. Like so explain that. to me. You know, it's funny. It's uh, when we went to talk to Wes Adams, state's attorney, and he started to explain how the courts worked. And like, there was this voice inside me within the first 10 seconds going like, dude, I understand how this works. And like, a minute later, I'm like, I didn't know that. I didn't know any, because it gets complex. You have like, you know, district judges, you have um, appellate judges, you know, uh, circuit judges. And so how, for, for those, I mean, I know, of course, I mean, you know, but for those who are listening who don't know how all the courts work. Well, Anne Rundle is, um, in some ways, at least in terms of what the judges have oversight of in circuit courts, a little unique in that you, at any given time, can pick up a mixture of cases, both criminal and civil. And, of course, a subset, a big subset of civil are family law matters, be they custody, alimony, divorce, even adoptions, which are one of the rare sort of pure good days, if yeah. you will. But the... Um, a circuit court serves as both an appellate court from the district court. Someone can have a full trial in district court and then have a de novo new trial in circuit court. And certainly when you come to circuit court, the unique factor of circuit court, different from district court, is this is the first court of primary instance where you have a jury. A pettit jury is what the technical name is. So in district court, if you have a trial, it's a court trial or sometimes referred to as a bench trial. If you pray a jury, meaning that you ask to move from circuit from district court to circuit court, uh, it's then an option to have a jury. Now, you can waive a jury and you can still have your case decided by a judge who can serve as both the fact finder and the purveyor of the law as well. But that's one of the um, 
obviously the the key distinguishing factors between circuit court and district court. Circuit court is a court of general jurisdiction, so you can hear all matters. And in addition to that, one of the things that's overlooked is sometimes we serve based on statute as an appellate court, not only for what comes from district court, but also from the administrative law world, such as workman's comp appeals and uh, administrative law decisions can come to us as well. So you're covering everything across the board. Essentially, there's, there's nothing that would not come to us in some form or fashion. So you could say, well, we could be the appellate forum for, say, the Anne Arundel County Zoning Board. We could serve as an appellate court for that. But felony trials, by and large, begin in circuit court, however. The reason we're talking to you today is a lot because we like to see, it's kind of like uh, people in our neighborhood from Sesame Street. You know, we find that there's interesting stories with the people that you just kind of take for granted mm. who run things. And we have a few series coming up with the, the people that you pass all the time in town and you never really think about. But I'm always interested in why people get to the place where they are. I mean, you went to the Naval Academy, yes? No, I went to Duke undergrad as a- Duke a, undergrad. Was ROTC, right. And so, oh, so that was so, a quid pro quo. Yeah, I owed so, him some time when I got out of there. So Duke and then law degree from uh, UVA? Correct. Uh, and then, then you became a New York boy for a while. Yeah, it was, uh, for me, it was a, um, you know, it's hard to believe how long 9-11, how long it's actually been. You know, it's hard to believe it's been 16 mm-hmm. years. When I got out of the Navy, I was um, anxious to come back here. I deemed this to be home. My parents lived here, my brother and his family. Even though I was a Navy brat, this was always sort of the hub on an axle and everything else. All the moves away from here were just sort of spokes on that axle. We always came back here. <laughs> and when I finally got out of the Navy, that was my intent. And then right at that almost the exact same time when I was about ready to bust a move to come back here, 9-11 happened. And it was a real sort of seminal moment in my career. I, I thought, well, you know what? I haven't exactly gotten rich in the Navy. I enjoyed my service. I enjoyed the time. And I and I was, at the time, I was thankful that I had a stint. What I saw as what would have been my stint in public service. And I thought, well, I'll just go do the firm thing. Well, and, you saw some lovely places. You saw Iraq and Kosovo. Yeah, that's and right. That's right. But anyway, 9-11 happened, and um, it just really incited a fire in the belly. And for a short period of time, I thought, well, maybe I'll go back in the military. Unfortunately, my dad, uh, who's a career Navy, he came alongside me and he said, you know, I'm not saying you can't do that, but just try to think more broadly. You've got this law degree. Do you want to do something uniquely tailored to service, but with the law degree that you have? And I knew um, a couple people uh, who worked in Manhattan at the time. Manhattan really looked like it was bleeding. I mean, it, it just, I think in a way that we forget and probably take for granted to some degree, it really, you wondered whether it was going to come back in a way that it remarkably did in a very short period of time. But that same week at 9-11, I drove up to Manhattan and it was, it felt like a demilitarized zone. There was about an inch of detritus covering everything below, say, Canal Street. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I went and parked myself in the vestibule of the um, DA's office. And uh, it's hard not to look into signs. I, I basically perched myself there uh, using some connections, but really just being a nuisance, a constructive nuisance in the lobby. Uh, That's and how I got married. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Just sheer demand, adverse yeah. possession. Just going, all right, fine, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Path of least resistance. Mm. But anyway, but Morgenthau, who was the, sort of the story. DA, I mean, he had been a DA tantamount to what we call state's attorneys here uh, in Manhattan for over 30 years. He was um, 86 when I went to work for him. When I finally left, he was 93. (laughs) But he's just a juggernaut. And uh, it turns out he had been in the Navy in World War II. And we hit it off because his his ship had twice been sunk by German U-boats. And the ship that fished him out of the water the second time was the Nicholson, which was the name of the ship that I served on for almost five years. Oh, that's cool. So we made that bond. And, you know, I knew that probably had the job at that point. But it was like everything. It was a fish or a frog in a boiling pot of water. I thought I'd be there a couple of years, several years. And, and then life happens. And I ended up being there a little bit longer, about seven and a half years. I did a little research. I was stalking a little bit online. So you were involved in the, the official corruption unit, the special narcotics unit, excellence in prosecution of fraud, excellence in prosecution of violent crimes. Those are both recent awards. Do you develop a specialty when you go into prosecution? Uh, you do, typically. I mean, not that you can't reinvent yourself. But, but I mean, I the complexities of, say, like fraud. I mean, that that's something there's, there's so many layers and levels and to understand the complex financial dealings and the way to bury money. I mean, that that's something that you just don't get a case and then move on to something else. I mean, you, you probably become a specialist at some point. Yeah, I think that's right. But I, I do think that there's a slight exception to that, which is when I first began as a prosecutor, there were clear tracks, and one was a homicide track. Every violent crime you do, whether it's a robbery or a sexual assault, was sort of a push in that general direction. But then I think there was sort of a collective epiphany that happened in the in the trade, if you will, that even the most sort of Bay Street crimes involve complexities, largely with the advent of technology. And so I think that the collective wisdom has become that you have to cross-train in all different fields of prosecution, because that just obviously becomes 
almost a, a necessary skill set to be functional. And, and so if you move into a narcotics realm, clearly cell phones are a huge part of it, but the money laundering aspect is huge. Well, everything. And, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, because, I mean, you talk about, I guess that opens up conspiracy. You can do this cross state, especially in an area like this, where you know, on the East Coast, where the where the states are right on top of each other. That's right. So you can that's be right. in D.C., which is just twenty twenty two miles away, and it's all of a sudden that's across state lines. That's right. And if a cell phone's involved, uh, or, because it's not just cell phone anymore; it's a computer. That's right. I think uh, I, don't, I actually I don't know if they decided that uh, the Supreme Court with whether they could look into a uh, phone for information. You know, yeah. it was the unlocking the phone, and then the argument. I have a friend who's who's a police officer. And his argument was, "You're taking a tool away," and me as constitutionalists are going, yeah, but it's not it's not a phone anymore. It is access to every aspect of that person's life. That's right. Because it's not simply a communications device anymore. Yeah. But I mean, that seems like it's made law that much more complicated because these are issues that you weren't dealing with 10 years ago. Yeah, it's true that I think the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence that deals with search and seizure cannot keep pace with the change in technology. And so Fourth Amendment search and seizure almost goes back to at its most simple form, protections and security in your home. And then, of course, we migrated away from that. And then well, Scalia actually didn't, he didn't even own a phone, a cell phone. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that, that, that's that was a point of pride me. for yeah. him. Yeah, right. Exactly. He, he's like, I don't even own a cell phone. I'm like, and you're, let alone, he didn't even have a flip phone or didn't have a flip phone, let alone a smartphone. And right. that kind of spooked me a little bit. You know, and that's exactly right. And it's it's funny. I think that the fact that we expect surgeons to stay abreast of trade magazines and uh, and stay sort of facile with technology, at least in the advent of advances in medical science, I think there should be something analogous to that for judges especially, but probably practitioners generally. Well, that was what worries me with the Supreme Court, actually, to be honest, is when you talk about technology, we're getting to a point. I mean, I'm look, I'm a tech guy. I'm big on that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting to a point in my life where some stuff's starting to go by me a little bit or it takes me a little bit right. longer. And I'm like, oh, I must be getting older, you know, and I'm not that old, but I mean, but I look at Ruth Gator Ginsburg or, and, uh, and all, they're all like what, in their seventies and eighties. How can we expect them to understand technology? But this technology is so critical when you're talking about online copyright law or you're talking about, you know, the fourth amendment issue with, with smartphones and the FCC, you know, the broadband situations with the throttling. I mean, that's a complex concept for someone in their 70s and 80s who, you know, right. 30 years ago wouldn't be able to set the clocks on their VCRs. <laughs> and I'm not making fun of them. I'm no, just being no, practical. No, clearly. But, and we see it in our kids. I mean, they, you know, there will be, be like minority report. They'll be manipulating right. something like holographs or something three-dimensional in, in space in front of them. And we'll just be lost by that. But, you know, it's funny. I was listening to uh, Paul Simon Graceland yesterday. Love that album. 1986. Lightning in a Bottle, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's unbelievable. But there's that one song, uh, Loose Affiliation, Lasers in the Jungle Somewhere. Right. And the staccato follows us in slow-mo. And he's basically, near as I could tell, talking about just sort of the brave new world that is the technology around him. In 1986. Right. And how do you reconcile that with, you know, basically- Not a judge and a poet. Look at you. (laughs) But I was laughing, thinking, my Lord, you know, Paul Simon thought we were at the- I mean, what had to feel like the vanguard or outer limit of technology. And, of course, that was just just the uh, genesis of what's But really- we all do that, I think. You know, is you always think – but I think this is the example that where it's the real deal, where we all think that we are uh, – like in 1970 – I remember uh, in 1979, I was saving up my money – to buy those, you know, those headphones with the radio built in. Right. And my father, who's a very forward thinker, he had said at that point, no, no, you, you want to save your money and get this Walkman. Mm-hmm. They're coming out with a Walkman and it's going to, and it was huge. It was oh, a yeah. huge, huge deal. Yep. And we thought that was the vanguard of technology. And, you know, and we had a bunch of you know, video games and a bunch of things that happened. But now um, those things are all happening and it's happening at a much faster pace than any time before. Yeah. I'd say the last 15 years, technology is moving so quickly. And I, I don't know if the law can keep up, you know. Yeah, or, no, it can't. And so it's interesting as a judge because you think, well, I, I pride myself on strictly applying the law. But the problem is I think anyone is not being fully honest if they say that there's still not room for creative interpretation only because – you can't strictly apply the law to some paradigms and some fact circumstances that are strictly wedded and bound to technology. And so – I think if you're looking right now with – they're talking about the bump stock ban and they're talking right. about the, the gun technology. And, you know, forget the Second Amendment issue as far as, you know, should that be uh, – should we look at the Second Amendment in general? But you're looking at the technology going – this is, and you hear people say this over and over. This is technology that we, that the founding fathers never conceived of. Right. You know, and, and that's just, and that's just in, they never conceived of the internet. They never conceived of cell phones or, or any of these things. And that's where you say, you know, how can we apply a 200 plus year old document? I'm not saying you can't, yeah. but I'm saying now you get into wild extrapolation uh, as to what they intended and what right. they didn't. And, you know, you as a judge, you, you, you have lives, the lives of people in your hands and you are charged with that Herculean task of, 
disseminating what the law, the tension of the law that was made, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago and how it applies today. I mean, there's some stuff that never changes like domestic violence or, you know, theft or, you know, all those things. But, you know, it's starting to get a lot murkier and trickier. It is, especially because the doctrines you, you apply are based on reasonable expectations of privacy. And the, the, that is a moving target as well. And an example of that would be when I was in law school, um, there was a case called Kyla that was a big decision that the Supreme Court, I think Sandra Day O'Connor ultimately wrote the, the majority opinion on that case. But the idea was, do police officers need a search warrant to sit outside your home with a thermal imager? Right. And, and Stingers. Sort of, exa- exactly. Same way. Right. And the conclusion was at the time, yes, and that's still good law. But the question is, will that ever be revisited if an iPhone suddenly has the technology to do that as well? Or suddenly, drones. Or drones, exactly. Right. That's you know, exactly can, if, right. if I'm tall enough to see over your fence, can I not look at your, you know, stand on my tiptoes and look in? Well, what if someone gives me a boost? I sit on their shoulders. Or, or you know, now what if we have a drone? Is right. it? I mean, that's that's tricky stuff. Yeah, or even Google in the sky. I was at a training a couple of years ago where, now Grant, you have to check the uh, – motives of the actual lecture. I can't remember what agency he was from, but he introduced about 10 to 15 latitudes and longitudes from Google Earth, and they all directly uh, drilled down on someone that was nude sunbathing in different parts of the world. I think he had all... Is that online or is that... <laughs> I just... I'm going to cut you off. Right? Gonna, at least not. We'll talk afterward. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it, the point, obviously, was that, you know, these people are... They might have high fences, but has their reasonable expectation of privacy? Has it waned simply because there's a satellite up there taking images? We had an interesting... It wasn't a case. It was... Uh, super local. And it was about three years ago where I think um, the police officers in town, there was there was some issue, I can't remember what it was specifically, but I, th- the end of it was that there were um, black youths involved and they mm-hmm. didn't know who they were specifically. Mm-hmm. So what they had what a couple of the officers had done, they'd gone over to the Harbor House over in Eastport and they, they called the kids, some of the kids who were out there playing over and they took mm-hmm. their pictures. Mm-hmm. And there was that debate whether is that a Fourth Amendment violation and then people say, well, you, they don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a public place and, you know, you can take pictures. And the other people say, well, they called them over specifically mm-hmm. and is that not questioning, you know, so, uh, and shouldn't they've been informed of their rights or at least their legal guardians? And then my thing was always, well, try that at St. Mary's and see how, how, how <laughs> right, well how that would have gone out. Yeah. That's right. But it, now we all have cell phones. So if we, if we take pictures, you, you can do it, but it, it leaves some moral ambiguity. Uh, some woman on the Eastport forum on Facebook, I know you're not a big social mm-hmm. media guy, but, she had posted a picture of a guy at like the one of the car dealerships in town where she was getting work done on her car. And she took a picture of a guy who was sitting there holding his phone. And she said, this creep was, I'm pretty sure he was just uh, recording my daughter on his phone. Mm-hmm. And she goes, let's spread the word that he's a creep. And mm-hmm. you know, I kind of responded going, yeah, well, you can't prove he was doing anything. And even if he did, I think, you know, he's within his rights, no matter how creepy it is. Right. But the implication is that, you know, that, that he's guilty and we're going to publicly shame him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're going to put it I'm like, I think you're kind of lo- lo- legally culpable for it at this moment. Yeah. But um, we're just in a very ambiguous time right now, more so than any other time. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it's only going to get murkier. And an area that concerns me a lot is the um, preservation of evidence. And, um, you know, the, the standards are very high for discovery that you as a as a prosecutor of the state, you have to preserve evidence. And that where that's going to manifest most squarely in the next year or two will be body cameras. And so if you have six police officers, all with body cameras rolling, so to speak, capturing live footage, where is a society, either because of laws that are passed or as a judge implementing the statutes that already exist, are we going to say, here's the outer limit of the expectations of what Uh, the state reasonably has to preserve of evidence. Now, right now, the expectation is largely all of it. There isn't really a, a middle ground there, and that, I'm not saying there a should ton be. Of video, I mean, right? And petabytes you're ta- at some t- point. right, exactly beyond Terra. And so, the question becomes: physically, how do you simply do it? B, a, so that's a B. How do you make it available for the, the the defendant to study and evaluate with his his or her counsel? And then third, you know, how do you canvas to recoup all or to gather all that evidence? And so, I think that's something that um, it might even be a question ultimately for the General Assembly. Because I'm not sure that the practitioners and or the courts are the ones that should be making those decisions. I mean, that, those are decisions that really speak of who we are as a society. And and I think judges have to try to do the best they can to apply the laws that exist now. But I, that's one more area where I think the, the quick ability to retain huge, huge scores of data is going to t- you know test the outer boundaries of what the law requires. And so I'm not sure what the answers are, but it's a challenge in the near term. Do you miss litigation? You know, I I did when the, the two years that I was working for Governor Hogan as his deputy counsel, I I did. I always say the Brits have a better lock on it. They have the 
solicitors. Those are guys that, I don't know, write prospectuses for mutual funds or whatever solicitors do. Yeah, a friend of his, <laughs> who's, who's a Brit, and he, that's what he does. Right. He loves it. He's passionate. Right. And then barristers are the guys with the, or guys or gals with, with the powdered wigs, wigs yeah. go to court and argue. And I, I think that's a more honest. Well, you know, I never, I never knew the difference between the I two. I mean, I'm grossly simplifying, but, yeah, that, but that, that's, you've that's, got the right <laughs> audience for that. Um, <laughs> but I need uh, it grossly simplified. Right. Well, so do I. But I, I always think that here in the colonies, the fact that we just lump everyone together and say we're all attorneys is sort of a fiction because they really mm. are two different trades in some ways. And so for me, the time out of the courtroom, I really missed it. But having been back on the bench and back in court every day since last November, it's actually the best of, it even supersedes my expectations even as a, as a litigant in the courtroom because now I get to go to court almost every single day. And I love that. Do you, you know? get a rush from it? I mean, you get adrenaline rush. I, I worked in TV news for years. And you, and by the way, it's not like you were talking about Law & Order, how it, that's not like it is. I worked in TV news and it's not anything like you think it is. No, no. It is a lot more boring. It's just editing. It's it, shuffling tapes around at the right, time. Right, you're but, sort of monitoring. But when special when the special reports broke out and we were doing cut-ins and stuff, I mean, the adrenaline really got going. Yeah, it's. I always say it's, you know, it's probably 85% ennui and then 15% just you know, excitement. There's rarely a middle ground there. And, um, but what I love about the courtroom, especially it's just the, the, it's like a Norman Rockwell painting every day, the diversity that runs through a courtroom, you can have, you know, Gordon Gecko juxtaposed to, you know, the, the pauper and, and, you know, and everything in between. And I just think that that's what's so unifying or not unifying. What's we're looking for. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, sacred about the courts. Cause there's just not many forums. I mean, it, Churches, synagogues, temples, they all hold themselves out to be that, but very few in practice can achieve that. I'm not saying it's not an ideal, you know, but the court is where it actually is achieved in the sense that you've got every character, every, every, and you know, no one's, no one should be at least uh, excused from jury duty, but that's obviously not just the only fashion. It's the litigants. It's, it's everyone under the sun. And I love that about it. You sound like, uh, Tom Cruise in the movie with, uh, the, the client, not the client. Two good men. No, no, no. The, Jerry Maguire. No. <laughs> Risky business, no. <laughs> Cocktail. For, for year, he's, uh, oh, that's a good movie. Is um, it? No. But it's uh, where he, where the, at the end, he's a, he's a new lawyer. He just joins the firm. It's the firm. Oh, the firm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He joins the firm. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, he, and he goes, I love the law. You reminded me how much I love the law. And I just, I know a lot of attorneys who are like that, that they're just passionate about, you know, they have very, they have a lot of clarity of thought. Mm-hmm. So there's very little black and white in their world, you know, that, and that's their job is to relegate the black and white into something or the, the grays into black and white, something right. that we all understand. And I think there's, there's a love for doing that. Yeah, there, there is. And you have to love that it's an outcome that you can't dictate, you know, if you strictly apply the law. And I know it sounds cliche, but I'd say two thirds of the time the law leads into a direction that personally you agree with the outcome, just at a substantive level, whatever that is. But I'd say maybe a third to a quarter of the time, if you're strictly applying the law, it leads to an outcome that you don't necessarily, if you just, all things being equal, if you could be, you know, king for a day and just dictate outcomes, that's where the the law takes you somewhere else. And I appreciate that. Well, I think about Casey Anthony. I mean, we all know that she had something to do with the death of her daughter. We all, you know, that was, and, you know, certainly O.J. Simpson to an extent, but mostly Casey Anthony, because that was where they didn't prove their case. They didn't have, you know, so it's where the law justice was served in, in its purest sense, you know, but sometimes it's hard to live with that. Yeah. And I think it's hard when you see, especially if you say pro se litigant without an attorney and you realize that, um, that, but for maybe the dearth of advocacy or the sort of shortcomings of that individual, maybe the outcome would be different. Yeah. And I think that's I think hard. It's tough. Yeah. yeah. Where you see some, yeah. I, I had a friend of mine who represented herself in, in a case and it did not go well at all. And, and it was the same sort of thing that she was in the right. She was, had, had justice truly been served, she would have been, um, and it was, it was, it was family law. Yeah. Know? Yeah. But she didn't have, she couldn't, she couldn't uh, navigate the, the web, you know, yeah. the legal web. And yeah. that, that's most of the battle, I think, at some point. It is a big part of it. And uh, a lot of it is making sure that, you know, we have a notice pleading in the civil world. And, and a lot of it is not even what happens in the courtroom. But if you missed a certain critical waypoint, you can't go back in time. And so a lot of times you're shutting doors unwittingly, even though you don't know it as the process moves along. And so, and a lot of times that's what happens before it even arrives at sort of the courtroom, you know, the purview of the judge. So it's a, it's an interesting gig, but I do think think that it's always organic. In other words, it's the best thing we can come up. It's the best of the worst alternatives. And what I mean by that is, is um, no one's come up with a better system yet. And I just think that the well, trial by combat. I mean, <laughs> there you go. Come on. Now that's, that's, that's true. pretty that's, cool. That's, right. Especially when celebrities are involved. Right. Right? <laughs> is that a Game of Thrones reference? Yes. Oh, okay. Fair enough. A little slow in the uptake. So I look back. I remember when I was um, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Baltimore, I went out in the waiting room one time and it literally thought maybe I was being punked. 
uh, just because there was what looked like a the last maybe of the Hare Krishnas was still there. He had that, <laughs> he had that outfit. There was someone that clearly looked like maybe he was a member of the BGF gang. Then you had, I think you had a, it was either a rabbi or a priest, but it literally looked like you know, a joke that starts this right. Way. Exactly, it looked like this was a Saturday Night Live skit. You know, we had all the the mixes of the uh, sort of the societal framework, and they were all there to see someone else about an unrelated. I mean, a, a separate case, presumably. But to me, that was sort of the metaphor for just sort of what a mashup. Courts are the criminal justice system, the legal system generally. And- I pass by the courthouse, and it's always amazing to me just the the people who are outside. I mean, you can see people who just got married and they're thrilled. There are people who are like chain smoking mm, and holding right. their folders. That's right. And you can tell that their world's about to collapse. That's uh, right. I mean, you know, people who, who are coming out like pumping their fist. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, this is every time. Sometimes I'll just do an extra loop yep. just to see. Yep. You know, but it's it's just such an amalgam of. Emotions yep. and people, and like you said, I'll see people who you know they're dressed in a, in a tailor suit coming out, and then people with the face tattoos, and you know it just. But it's it's a mix of absolutely everybody. It's the I still can't come up with the word that it's. Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I don't want to say toss. I don't want to say salad. I don't want. Yeah. Certainly don't want to say toss out. Don't want to say salad. Don't want to say. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. All those all those uh, examples are probably fall short. You know, the point is, it is all of the all the humanity all of the county and it's funny because where we sit can be mischaracterized you know sometimes this feels like Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket people walking around with watermelons on their belts and you know a little, <laughs> little crab claw um sort of uh, Nantucket red pants and you she know. stepped on yeah. the ball <laughs> exactly and so in that way it's refreshing to cut by this part of church circle because you're clearly pulling from other parts of the county let's just say that and I think that's well because yeah I mean Ward 1 where we are now it's a little sanitized that's I mean, right it's, it's, it's no ascots but you know sometimes we're about a hair switch short of that that's right <laughs> well listen I enjoyed this talk I got to uh, I got to hang with the judge and not be charged with anything which is awesome <laughs> so I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your Columbus day go out golfing or do whatever judge things do yeah. all right all right. Well, I might sit here and actually read a little and then go golfing. But thank you, Tim. We sure appreciate it. All right, Michael. Well, thanks much. All this right. is great. All right. Have a good rest of your day. This has been the Maryland Crabs podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously. Go. You're still here? It's over. Go home.